want to welcome you to 11:30 Wednesday luncheon Bible study from Doctrine Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We're so appreciative of you coming in. Uh, we are in a new study uh, called "The Days of Noah," taken from Jesus' discussion about the days of Noah. He said, "As it as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man." In Matthew 24, 37 through 39, which we talked about last week. Uh, and he's talking about the period of time that would be covered in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. Uh, that would be the days of Noah to the flood, the world flood. And so that's where we are. We're, go we're going to talk about our lesson title today is the days of Noah. We're going to talk about that because when you read the life of Noah, there, is, there are several days. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. There are several days uh, mentioned about his life, like 500 and all of that. So we'll talk about that in a moment. What days of Noah exactly is Jesus talking about? Well, Jesus tells us, and we'll discuss it today and see how important that would be to our life. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, and he describes what he's talking about in Matthew 24, so shall it be in the days of the Son. Well, we live in the days of the Son of Man. And so this, this study should be correlated to our life, in my opinion, and I'm going to direct it that way. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. We could well say, so it is in the days of Ron Adama or whoever your name. If you're a believer, a new covenant church age believer, then when he talks about the days of the Son of Man, we're in the days. These are our days. We're in the days of the Son of Man. And he says, I want you to, I want you to pay attention to those days that you're living in, in the Son of Man. Watch the correlation to the evil that was in the days of Noah. And so that's where we are. So let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin in a Christian's life. That could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. What should I do to get out of carnality of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3? How do I get out of carnality back into spirituality of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? Well, I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, to cleanse me from it. And that cleansing takes us back to verse 7 in 1 John 1, 7, and it takes us to the cross of Jesus Christ as a believer, not as an unbeliever. When I went to the cross of Jesus Christ as an unbeliever, I needed salvation. When I come with personal sin as a believer, to the cross of Jesus Christ. I've, I've been given forgiveness. He is just and faithful to forgive me and to cleanse me. I get the cleansing, the cleansing for sanctification, not for justification, for sanctification, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit inside my life and outside my life as it has demonstrated the life of Christ to other people. So I'm going to give you a moment to confess sin. It could be mental attitude type sins of the tongue, overt sins. You need to make those confessions if necessary, out of carnality into spirituality, so that the Holy Spirit can teach and recall the truths of the Word of God that we're going to study today out of the days of Noah that could be correlated to our days and what we should look for and how to, how to uh, live through it, how to be faithful to God, and how to have a ministry outside of us. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence through your priesthood of 2 Peter 2 to confess your sins and allow the, Holy, the, allow the blood of Christ to cleanse my personal sins to restore me to sanctification, not justification, sanctification. So our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us the word of God out of Genesis 6-3. As we look today at the days of Noah, and what Noah was going through before the flood that ended his civilization called the antediluvian civilization. 
I pray the Holy Spirit would teach us today, Father, some relevant truths that we could apply to our lives, our lives that are lived in the days of the Son of Man. For I've made my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, what is really interesting, if you do a study in the Bible of the days of different people, like the days of Noah, the days of Elijah, and there, if you looked, if you studied it in a concordance and looked up the days of certain people in the Bible, you would find some very interesting things that's mentioned a lot. And I'll mention three, uh, the days of the son of man, the days of the son of Noah, and the days of Elijah. Now, the reason I say that is I'm doing a study on the days of Noah, comparing it with the days of Christ, and I've already completed a study this year on the days of Elijah in comparing what Elijah, the days of Elijah were to the COVID-19 virus that we've been going through. Now we're taking a, a look at a larger picture at the days of Noah about that. But what's interesting that when you find the statement that God puts in the Bible, the days of somebody, it's focused on the importance of the character of the individual and the time period in which he is living and what they are combating in the angelic conflict of their day. And every time you find it, you're going to find a wonderful story, a wonderful story uh, of the days of a specific a believer and how God has called him uh, or her to live in the dynamics of that day faithfully to God and how God is in control of everything around him. And so uh, we're in the days of Noah, and I want you to remember that. There, I mean, there is a study all of its own. I mean, I could do 15 different studies like I'm doing this one, the days of Noah. I could do it. I just did the days of Elijah. And now I'm doing the days of Noah, but it's used a lot in the Bible to earmark certain things. And so I'm doing the days of Noah here. We're going to look at five things today out of, uh, and listen, if you pick up the notes later, you can come back to our website, doctrinestudies.com and pick up our notes. In the meantime, get a Bible. You know the protocol, get a Bible, a piece of paper, notebook or whatever you have, and a pencil or a pen and Let's take notes. Now let's, let's get after this thing. I'm going to talk about five things today that I want to introduce you to the, light, to the days of Noah. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, five things, remember that, five things uh, about the days of Noah that would be in the antediluvian period, the period from Adam to Noah uh, prior to the flood of the world, and uh, uh, that would be the Gentile age the Gentile dispensation, okay? This is my second study. So you've, if, you, if you've just dropped in, go back and pick up the first study so you can be current with us because they build. Uh, point number one, Jesus described the days of Noah as the last 120 years uh, prior to the divine judgment of the antediluvian world by the flood of water. Now, we'll get to that when we get, get over there into the 8th and ninth chapters. We'll get into that subject matter in more detail. I'm just laying it out for you. That's going to be the study of Genesis 6 all the way through 9. Uh, it is also what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, which we've already discussed and taught. What's interesting is this little phrase, that he talks about, Jesus mentions the days of Noah are like, the days of the Son of Man will be like the days of Jonah. And he gives us a clue about what days, because when you study the life of Noah, you find I, his identity with different uh, periods of age. For example, in the fifth chapter of Genesis, in the fifth chapter, verse 32, it says Noah is 500 years old uh, when he had, his, had three sons. When we go to 
our passage today, Genesis 3, Genesis 6, 3, which I'll read. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years, 120 years, the days, and it'll be done. The flood will come in 120 years. That's the idea. And so we find another thing. We find that the last 120 years of Noah's life, when that 120 years is over, the flood will come. And so we have another, another period of days in the life of Noah uh, before the flood. In Genesis 9.28, Noah will be, he will live 350 years after the flood. These numbers will, will become better as we study along the life of Elijah. I'm just showing you that when he says the days of Elijah, I mean the days of Noah, when he says the days of Noah, had he not given us direction on it, we wouldn't know where, where to go because there are different, different ages or days mentioned with the life of Noah as you study the life of Noah in the scriptures. In Genesis 9.20, Noah will die at the age of 950. I'm going to take a look at that just for a minute. Yeah, in 928, it says he lived 350 years after the flood. In 29, it says all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. That's the first thing. So it, had he not told us that he's talking about 120 years while Noah is alive, the flood would come. We're not sure if he just said the days of Noah. We're not, we wouldn't be sure. And what I like about this is God is always sure. Well, we may not be. He is. And you need to know that. God is always in control. And, and what that means to you and I, God is control. I mean, that's, that's a, a big statement. God is in control. What that means to me is that God is faithful, and he's faithful every day, all the time. God is faithful. When we sing it in the church, God is faithful. Faith that God is faithful. And we're reminded of that in this story, how faithful God is. Listen, he's faithful to tell you ahead of time uh, some things and other things he doesn't tell you ahead of time. And so you go like, well, how will I know what, what when, and what, what? Listen, you just live one day at a time. And know this as you live that one day at a time, because you can only live one day at a time, the one you got. You can't live yesterday, it's gone. Can't live tomorrow, it's not come. Only day you can live faithfully is today. We always live in the now. Now is the day of salvation, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6 2. Now. We live in the now. You lead to live in the now. Don't live in the past. Don't live in the future. Live in the now. I mean, that's what I learned from this, and that's what Noah, uh, jo that's what Jonah, that's exactly what Jonah, I say Jonah, that's what Noah had to do. I got everybody in the water today. Point number two. It is interesting to me, th this is kind of sidebar and we'll get to it, but it's interesting to me that Noah didn't begin his family until he was 500 years old. Now, at first glance, you say, yeah, but they lived in a period where everybody lived old. Methuselah, you know, you know lived almost to be a, a, a thousand. So everybody, you know, Adam, Adam lived 950 years after he sinned and and here's Noah. Noah lived 950 years. Everybody lived, oh, I mean, that's a good point. Everybody lived, but listen to this. If you go back and look at the genealogy of, from Adam uh, to Noah, and you look, and they tell you when they had, what age they had children at. They, they, they tell you that. Fifth, fifth chapter of Genesis, 
you will find that everybody was having children when they were in their hundreds while they were living to 900. They were having children in their hundreds, 130, 140. That, that area. Noah didn't begin to have children until he was 500 years old. In a culture that was having kids when they were 140 or 150, you know, we, we have that. People say, you know, this is when you should have children between this age and this age. You know, and if you go past that age, some magical age in 30, you shouldn't have children anymore. They're at risk. Well, in his civilization, he went way beyond that. Even though we're going to be told later, he didn't know how and he had 950 years. You don't know how many years you have. I mean, God's in control of that. Your birth date and your, and your death date certi certified is in the hands of God. I'm just telling you, Noah waited a long time to have children. So the question you might ask, culturally, he waited a long time to have kids. You, you might ask, well, what do you think that was? Do you suppose maybe his wife, they couldn't have kids or whatever? No indication of it. Usually God tells you. Usually, usually, and people in that period, they had babies early like they do with us. It is also interesting that Noah began his family after learning of the coming judgment upon the antediluvian civilization. You go like, why? I mean, I did. When I heard that, I went, what? He waited. He didn't, he didn't have his children. He waited until God said, there's 120 years left, and I'm going to bring a flood upon the world, and the world is going to be destroyed. That whole civilization is going to be destroyed. And he goes like, wow, I think I'll have some kids. You know, like, why? I know it's kind of interesting, isn't it? You say, well, how do you know that? I tell you how I know this. Because the flood's going to come in his 600th year of age. And his sons are old enough to get married. Because they and their wives board the ark. Just kind of interesting. Just kind of interesting. It's interesting that he doesn't begin his family until he learns there's a coming judgment upon the world. Where my, my second question in my mind was, where did Noah get the confidence to raise a family amidst an evil culture that's going to be destroyed? Because God told him 120 years and I'm going to destroy it. Well, we're going to look at that, too, as we meet his family. I'm going to tell you, your confidence must always be in God. You don't look at your circumstances around you. Look at Jesus. Listen, the writer of Hebrews, the 12th chapter in the verse 2 says, fix your eye. Listen, fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't fix them on the world. Fix them on Jesus. You got to read that. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Look above your circumstances. Look above your troubles. These are just an exercise of where you are in your spiritual life. We taught that out of the, out of the life of Elijah. You ought to go back and study that. I'll give you a, a, another passage you should read that's current. It's church age. You should read 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, 25 through 31. Because people always ask that. When should I have children? I mean, it looks like the evil culture. Why do I want to raise my kids now? Listen, it's never about what you see here. Fix your eyes on Jesus. You have kids, raise them. Uh, when they die, they go to heaven if, 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 you're, if, if you're spiritual with your children. Jesus comes back. If your children are spiritual, they're going to go. 
I don't know. I'm just telling you. It's interesting. Here's Genesis 6, 22. Then Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. You know, that's the secret of how you live in the midst of an evil culture. What's the Bible say? What has God commanded me? Then I do his will, not mine. Even Jesus had to do God's will and not his. You know, when he got ready to go to the cross in Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. I mean, this is, listen, if you're going to have a prayer of meaningful prayer to God, be sure you always have that in your meaningful prayer. Not my will, but thy will be done. Otherwise, your prayer is just gobbledygook. Here's what I want. God, now give it to me. That's not how it works. Man, that's a baby talking. That's a baby talking. Hebrews 11, chapter verse 6 says, you know what pleases God? Oh, I know, Ron, it's hard work. and put my hand on the ball. And, uh, uh, no, you know what pleases God? Your walk of faith. Hebrews 11, 6. What, what, uh, listen, what pleases God is your walk by faith. Eyes on Christ. Heart filled with the word of God. Obeying God's will. Doing God's will. You walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Romans 4, 21. Living this kind of a life that's described in Romans 4, 21. I love this passage. I quote it a lot. If you, if you pay attention to my ministry, you'll hear it quote a lot. What God has promised, he is able to perform. What he's promised you, he's not asking you to perform it. He's asking you to trust him to perform it. That The word of God takes you to the will of God, and the will of God takes you to the work of God. See, that's the formula. You, may, you need to know that. You need to learn that. Here's point number three. The days of Noah, as we will study Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, the days of Noah were filled with, the, with maximum evil upon the antediluvian civilization. The devil, maximum evil, polluted the entire culture with exception of four married couples. Noah and his three married sons. Eight people. 2 Peter 2, 5, talking about this very thing. And did not spare, and God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he, God, brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. How did this culture... This civilization, an entire civilization, be so corrupted, we call it angelic conflict or Satan's great attack upon the messianic seed of Christ. When you go to Luke, the third chapter, and read 36, 37, 38 of the genealogy of Jesus Christ that goes back to Adam, you can see how important that was. Who was, Jesus, who was Satan attacking? Genesis 3.15, the seed of Christ. Genesis 3.15, gosh, come on, people. Jude 6, angels who did not keep their own domain, that's fallen angels, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day, that's the judgment seat of Christ. Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 10, and Matthew 25, 41. You know what that's going to be? It's the lake of fire. The lake of fire. You see, what the writer has told you in Jude 6 is how the, an entire civilization got corrupted to a point of maximum evil 
where God is going to have to destroy a whole civilization. Think about that. I'll tell you why you should think about it, dear hearts. You should think about it because as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. That's why you should think about it. I'm just saying. <laughs> Point number four. The days of Noah were a time of the long-suffering of God towards the unbelieving world so that none would perish. 120 years. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord, is not, the Lord is not slow about his promises. 120 years. Not slow. 120 years. Not slow. Noah. Noah. At 500 600. Flood comes in 600. Then you've got Noah dies at 950. Lived 350 years after the flood. God still had a plan for his life. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient. Isn't that interesting how he compared the two? Not slow regarding his pro pro promise, but patient. Patient. I mean, how do you deal with the promises of God? Patience. Where did patience come from? Well, one source is the indwelling Holy Spirit. One of them is the fruit of the Spirit. And the other comes from confidence, but comes from faith in the confidence of the character of God to what he's promised you. You walk by faith, not by sight. Wouldn't that be good if you would do that in your life? Your life would so dramatically change by those simple principles I just spoke. But God is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. You ought to read the whole chapter of 2 Peter 3, talking about judgment. Now look. What is God patient with? He's patient with people. He gives them the gospel that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. And he says, I want you to come to me by faith, not works. I want you to come. Justification is a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift. Justified by the blood of Christ, the work of Christ, the person and work of Christ on the cross. See, it's all about a choice. You have volition. It's a choice. Will you believe and accept? The only way you're going to get saved is you have to believe. Romans 1, 16, the gospel that he died, buried, and raised from the dead for your life, for you. That gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. Now listen to people tell you you have to do something. What you have to do is you have to believe it. When you believe it, you're saved. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. Yada, yada. You need to read the Bible. Stop reading what you want to hear and start reading it to hear what God wants to tell you. It would be a big difference in your life. That's yeah, a choice. God is not slow about his promise. What? Get saved and get on the ark. Flood's coming. It's going to destroy everything. It's a choice. Get saved and get on the ark. These are choices. First Peter, third chapter, verses 19 and 20. In which also he, Jesus, 
in his burial. He dies on a cross. He's buried three days later. He's raised from the dead, in which also he, Jesus Christ, went and made proclamation to the spirits. The spirits, those are the fallen angels, dis disembodied spirits. These are the angels, the fallen angels that corrupted. The We're going to talk about it. The these are uh, from Genesis 6. Are now in prison, the heart of the earth, in a place called Tyrus, during a uh, prison who once were disobedient when the patience when the patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark that 120 years in which few that is eight were brought out safely oh you ought to underline that brought out safely you ought to thank God for that idea because as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of the son of man all believers, when Jesus Christ returns, all the believers will go out safely in what's called the rapture. That is it. Point number five. The days of Noah were a time of great rejection of God consciousness and gospel hearing of the faithful preaching of Noah who preached God's righteousness in Christ. I just read that in Genesis 6.3. 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20 told you the same thing. Now listen to me. Days of Noah. There was only one source of deliverance from the flood. That was the preaching of God's righteousness in Christ for salvation. Only one source of deliverance from the flood, divine judgment. It involved two steps. First, they had to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And secondly, when the time came, they had a free pass to board the ark. Got to be saved. Then you get a free pass to the ark. Noah's family did it. That was the procedure. Jesus talked about it in John 3, 16. He talks, John, talked, John talks about it again in 1 John 5, 11 through 13. You see, God paid the price by his grace in Christ to get a free pass on the ark trip. The flood's coming. You know what we call the second coming of Christ in theology, eschatology, the study of the last days. Eschatology. It's a whole theology subject connected with the second coming of Christ. Well, let me tell you this. Let me tell you the ark will not make a return trip. When the boat leaves, it's over. When the church leaves, it's over. As it was in the days of Noah, shall be in the days of the Son of Man. There's not going to be a return trip. There is only one way out from eternal judgment, and that's by God's grace delivery in Christ Jesus, who died on a cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. Galatians 3, 8. That's how Abraham got saved. That's how everybody gets saved. A prophetic gospel in the Old Covenant, a historical gospel in the New Covenant. Hmm. Here's a principle. The ark will leave... The antediluvian civilization on God's schedule and timing. And the passengers must be ready at a moment's notice. It's interesting to me that all the animals went on it. They heard the call and they went two by two on it. 
and thereabout. We'll study that. And yet only eight human beings who had volition and chose not to go, chose not to believe, chose not to go. Let me tell you, when you reject the free gift of grace, you're left to deal with judgment. If you accept that, if you accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, the judgment's been paid. You got a free pass to the ark. You got a Listen, God delivered them safely out of the flood. Here's a principle. The days of Noah were important to the, are important to the church age believer because they are compared with the days of the Son of Man. Here's a principle. We must take the gospel of the grace salvation seriously because it is the only way out of the world safely to heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 7, and 8. So let me talk about some days for you in closing. How about the day of salvation? Listen to what Paul wrote. He's quoting Isaiah 49.8 when he said this. At the acceptable time, I listened to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know what he said? Now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. Well, I'll get saved tomorrow. No, no, you'll get saved now. Because you live in the now. And you die in the now. You don't die yesterday. You don't die tomorrow. You die now. When, when it comes to your time, you will die now. And it will be put down on your death certificate, the date. And the date will have been the, the now when you died. And I'm telling you, you don't have the promise of tomorrow unless you're in Christ. You have the promise of judgment, not deliverance. I don't know how to plead with you anymore. And, I, and you all, well, I've got time. No, you ain't got time. Listen, you, listen if you've got a watch on or if you've got a cell phone, flick it on. Listen, you don't have the rest of the day to be certain. What are you talking about? Paul hit it right. He said, now is the day. Now is the time. Now is the time. You need to listen to me. Now is the time. Christ died for your sins in the past, was buried and raised from the dead, so that now you could be saved because you don't know when you're going to die or when the Lord is going to come. Only the Lord, listen, only God himself knows when the ark is going to leave. You've got to be ready. My, my, my. How about Psalms 118, 24? This is the day the Lord has made. What day? The now day. Today. This is the day the Lord has made. What day is that? It's the today. It's today. Rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Or how about this one? Matthew 6, 11 tells you your daily bread. Your daily bread. God is so faithful to give you your daily bread. You belong to the family of God in Christ. If you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you're part of the family of God. The Father will take care of you, not only in your salvation, but in your life and in your death. He will take care of you. And he'll do it today. My, my, my. Why are you holding off? Salvation is a wonderful gift. It requires nothing from you but to believe. Well, yeah, and afterwards, uh, then you'll want my pocketbook, and you'll want this, and you'll want that. No, it won't. God will never ask you for anything like that. My, my, my. 
Well, let's pray. You need to get saved. These are the days of the Son of Man and the urgency that I'm pleading with you as a preacher of God's righteousness in Christ is to get saved and do it today. Not tomorrow. You say, Ron, what do I have to do? I'm going to remind you again. You've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. Then you go to our website and you click on and we'll walk you through what that means. You go to our webpage and you look at our webpage. You, be, you begin to, and there will be a place there for new converts, new, new, new believers in Christ. And we'll help you grow in this, in your faith. We'll help you. But you got to do it today. Don't put it off. Listen, God is long-suffering and patient towards you that, not, that you would not perish. Father, I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God today as we have spoken it and the urgency of our voice, the urgency of the hour of today to be saved, to believe that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. We are saved by grace through faith and not of ourself as a gift, not of works, least man would boast. And no boast, Father, it's all praise to you for the grace, salvation. What a wonderful gift. I pray that those today would understand the urgency of the hour. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. What should we look for? Look for evil in the world that is getting out of control. Look for evil that is rampant. And you will know the sign. Help us understand it, Father, as we go through the days of Noah, we will go through the days of the Son of Man. Let, us be, let our hearts be awakened to the truth. In Jesus' name, amen.